Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the ComSorg seminar. Today, we are having the second edition of our oldies but goodies uh, sessions, uh, where we've invited uh, volunteers to talk about papers that may be a bit older and haven't gotten the attention that they deserve. And so they're getting a second chance. Today, we're having four talks. Each talk will be 10 plus five minutes, so 10 minutes for the talk and then five minutes for questions. Uh, feel free to write questions uh, in the chat, uh, indicating clearly that you are doing that, like so. And then after the talk, we can go through them together. All right. Uh, after two talks, we will have a, a little break, a 10 minute coffee break, uh, where we're going to go into random breakout rooms and then we can socialize there. All right, so let's get started. Our first talk today will be by Annick Lawell about games with perception. Let's go. Okay, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, the, the paper I, I'm going to, to present uh, is a seven years old uh, paper and it was a joint work with uh, two colleagues from then uh, Bilbao, Elena Inyara and Peyo Swaso Karim. Uh, a bit to, to fix idea, let me start with uh, a classical game of uh, coordination with uh, two uh, equilibrium in uh, pure strategies and one in mixed strategy. So you have the two equilibrium which are uh, cooperate, cooperate or defect, defect. And the question is uh, what equilibrium uh, should be played? And you can see that each of the equilibrium has something for, for itself. The first one, cooperate, cooperate, is good because it has the highest uh, payoff for both players, while the other equilibrium is uh, safer in the sense that uh, if I expect uh, the other one to play defect, but finally he decides to, to cooperate, uh, the payoff that I, I will get in this case is uh, eight. So each equilibrium has something for, for itself. And Alman, uh, who proposed this uh, game, uh, concluded that, uh, well, the final choice of the, the player will depend on uh, the, the, BA, the, the how the, the player is, if he is careful or prudent. And the main question is, will the other trust me to, to cooperate? And uh, this, uh, this type is, of game is what could be called uh, games without uh, perception because player cannot see uh, the, the opponent. Nevertheless, when we go to uh, experimental uh, game theory and when you allow people to see the, the opponent, there are experiments that show that, for instance, there exists uh, a beauty premium and that people take into account uh, what uh, they see uh, in front of, of them. And so what is proposed is this paper is to say that uh, we allow uh, people to see the, the opponent. So allow Alice to see Bob and allow her to, to play accordingly. That is to say, allow her to, to say, for instance, I could play a strategy which would be a cooperative Bob looks trustful and defect if he doesn't look uh, trustful. In the same way, allow uh, Bob to see Alice and uh, play accordingly. And this corresponds uh, to what has been seen in psychology, which is that uh, with very few uh, seconds, people can already make uh, an opinion about uh, personality traits, oriental sexuality, uh, sexual orientation, popularity, or whatever of uh, the, the opponent. And so uh, what we add in the, the framework is to add what we call a, a perception. So 
it will be related to a given uh, characteristic, which might be uh, being trustful, being attractive, being smart and whatever. And people, uh, players have type. So, and the two types are either the, the opponent is perceived with the characteristic, either the opponent is perceived without it. And so uh, we have beliefs. So my beliefs will be, uh, A beliefs will be, if I see the other one with the characteristic, which is the probability that I assign uh, to he seeing myself with the characteristic and the, the complement plus what is the probability if I do not see him with the characteristic, which is the probability that I assign uh, him seeing me with the characteristic. This is for player A and for player B. So uh, again, with uh, perception will be basically a Bayesian game with the classical uh, matrix and we add the, the beliefs player A believes and player B uh, believes. And what we do is in this paper basically is to provide the taxonomy of the possible uh, beliefs. Uh, because uh, the, the type of belief will depend on the type of characteristics that we have. For instance, if I take as characteristic attractiveness, so uh, what can I say if I am uh, Alice? Basically, what will be, so P1 and P2 will be respectively the probability of being perceived as attractive. Uh, if I see the other one as attractive or if I see the other one as not attractive. So basically, if I face a brat or bean, Basically, uh, the probability that I assign to my being perceived as uh, attractive will be uh, certainly uh, smaller if I see brat than if I see a B. And the same uh, for, for Bob. If Bob face uh, Angela or, or Anik, uh, surely the, the probability that he will assign to being perceived as attractive will be smaller if he face Angela than if he face, faces Anik. So what characterize, uh, characterize the characteristics of the type uh, attractiveness Surely we will have P1 smaller than PB, P2, sorry, and Q1 smaller than Q2. So we will call in this case that we will say that the beliefs are demanding, and demanding beliefs are characterized by P1 smaller than P2 and Q1 smaller than Q2. And this will be basically the case for uh, attractiveness or intelligence. By contrary, if I have a characteristic which is uh, kind of an emotion, for instance, being trustful, certainly it will be uh, the opposite way. That is to say the probability that I assign to my being seen as trustful will be higher if I see than the other is trustful that seems to me trustful than the opposite. And so the, the same for, for the other uh, person. So I will call, I will say that the beliefs are contagious if P1 is larger than P2 and Q1 larger than Q2. And basically this will be for characteristics that are uh, emotion. And there is a third type of uh, belief that I call uh, free, following, following uh, Despremont that already studied this one, that are the uh, characteristics that are objective. So for instance, if the characteristic is having blue eyes, 
the probability that I assign to the other one seeing me with blue eyes does not depend on whether I see him with blue eyes or not. So uh, we have these three types of uh, beliefs. Contagious belief, which are the ones with uh, the characteristic that P1 is larger than P2 and Q1 larger than Q2. Demanding if it is smaller and free if these are equal. And so uh, with this uh, taxonomy of the, the beliefs, I can mix this with all the types of uh, games that I have, coordination, anti-coordination, competitive, and then we can find uh, the uh, equilibria. And for, for instance, uh, if I have a coordination game with a contagious uh, belief, I can obtain a, an equilibrium where both player discriminates by discriminating i mean the not adopting the same uh, action depending on the type of the the opponent and one uh, equilibrium would be uh, both player cooperate if the opponent looks trustful and defect if the opponent does not look trustful by contrast if i have uh, demanding be beliefs then an equilibrium will be uh, a discrimination where a player choose the uh, opposite action than the other. And an equilibrium might be uh, at least cooperative, both looked attractive and defect otherwise, while uh, Bob does the opposite. It defect if at least look attractive and cooperate otherwise. So uh, basically, yeah, what we, we do in, uh, in this paper is to add a second component to, to classical uh, games, which is what we call the, the perception, and which is, what is not uh, classical in uh, game theory is that usually, usually in game theory, you know your type, but you do not know the type of the opponent. Here, it's a bit uh, the opposite. You see the type of the opponent, but you do not know how you are perceived. And uh, yeah, to to explain you basically where this uh, this idea uh, came from was that we had uh, studied uh, with the same colleague uh, Elena Inyara. Uh, a colleague, a biologist, uh, was uh, studying uh, chicken in a farm and uh, was marking uh, chicken. And they observed the, the aggression in the, the farm between the marked chicken and the non-marked chicken. And basically, it could be said that, uh, well, all the chicken had the same uh, capacities, the only a difference between them was the fact that some of them was um, were marked on the head and the other uh, were not. And obviously, we could imagine that chicken did not know, know the, the type, that is, they did not know whether they were marked or not. And what we we observed in the in the farm was that uh, the marked chicken uh, received uh, more aggression than non-marked chicken. This is why we had uh, made uh, the game theory model to, to model this, where a player did not know the, the own time, but could see the type of the, the opponent. And when we proposed this, uh, well, in, in seminar, people were asking what would happen with, uh, with human, and we were saying, well, human normally, they, they know their own type. They know who they are, but perhaps what can happen is that you do not know how you are uh, perceived. And uh, yeah, this was uh, the, the, the paper that we, we made uh, some uh, many years ago. 
but uh, now uh, basically i would say that we, we've taken uh, back uh, this model again because uh, a colleague uh, doctor came because uh, it seems that yeah, uh, in theory is used also to, to study uh, cancer i and think we have to go what? to questions now sorry ah sorry and so yeah we have an application uh, to this Okay, great. Thank you. Let's unmute ourselves and thank Anik. And I see Reshef has a question. Do you want to ask it? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, so uh, at least I, I heard this uh, like non-mathematical theory from some people in HR that even uh, when interviewing uh, employees that have like equal, so that the employer recognizes that they have equal uh, uh, skills uh, and they don't a priori want to discriminate, but they, they don't, they want to pay the minimum of course, because they're trying to save money. Uh, they would still sometimes offer lower salary to women just because they believe that these women are more likely to accept and from the other side the women even again that they know they have same skills but because they they expect to be offered lower salary uh they're more likely to agree uh, so there's like an arbitrary difference in in appearance so it could be the opposite it's like a symmetric situation a priori but not after the i don't know the equilibrium was somehow decided uh, so my question is, can a model like this, I don't know, explain this sort of equilibrium, of asymmetric uh, equilibrium? Uh, yeah, well, in this case, you would... Uh, yeah, I have to... to f Yeah, perhaps you could say if the the characteristic is not being a woman or not, but perhaps to be seen as smart or, or not, which might be linked. Well, I, I have to think about it. Okay, thanks. Any other questions, comments? All right. Thanks, Anik. Thank you. Uh, our second talk is by Li Rong uh, from a AMAS 2013 paper about designing social choice mechanisms using machine learning. Li Rong, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see the slides? Yes, we can. OK, OK, great. Thanks. Um, so um, thanks for organizing this great series. Um, it's a reasonably old paper and it was uh, um, published and talked at uh, AMAS uh, nine years ago. And uh, it was um, a challenges and divisions track. I think it was the first time they're using this name and then later on they changed it to uh, Blue Sky track. I think that's the current name. Um, so basically you can probably expect that this is not a very technical talk. It's just to have some interesting ideas, hopefully, and um, some interesting technical ideas. So, um, you are a famous social choice scientist. You are invited to uh, Utopia Republic, which is a very nice republic. It's very uh, democratic and everything is decided by voting. Everyone wants fairness. So oh, by the way, you are the guys on the right-hand side. Um, let me see if I can use the laser pointer. Yeah, this is you. Um, and then uh, the officer asks you to design a good voting rule for their presidential election uh, next time. And then they say, we want a fair voting rule. Please give me a fair voting rule. And you thought about it, why? And you were thinking, how about let's use plurality plus lexicographic tie breaking because uh, that's a simple one and uh, that satisfied the fairness condition uh, anonymity. But then the officer says, well, uh, we actually also want neutrality. So you are surprised because uh, she's very, well educated in the sense that she knows this property neutrality, which is great. But then you say, well, this is impossible due to the NR impossibility theorem. 
um, you probably should not do social choice. Um, the officer was not completely happy, but then she was proposing something differently, saying that, um, how about um, you give me a voting rule that puts equal weights on um, satisfaction of anonymity and satisfaction of neutrality in whatever way you deserve, you, you think, uh, you think in, uh, possible, and I, I'll trust your decision. So uh, you work it out uh, for, thought about it for about a week, and then you'll find a solution. Great. So you're very happy, and the officer was very happy. Now, because you did such a good job uh, later, many people come in and ask you for designing good voting rules. So next time, so this officer asks you to design the voting rule to choose the next um, president of the union. Now, uh, she said, uh, our population of the union wants 30% of weight anonymity and 70 on your child. Can you design a rule for us? A gentleman comes to you and try to design, find a voting rule for his family to choose the movies and say, we want 20% condos and 80% participation. Of course, you know these two are kind of incompatible. Um, can you design a rule for me? And some workers come and say, well, uh, we want to design the next project to build. I want 30% anonymity, 10% in charge, 20% condos and 40% participation. By the way, these numbers do sum up to one. So, now you have a whole lot of work to do. Great. So you exhaust yourself and work all of them out, these things out. That's very impressive, but you are uh, kind of uh, very tired. Now, uh, back to Earth. Um, the problem is the situation is not even really better, right? So in, in the good old days, we have high stakes, uh, low frequency uh, applications like voting or maybe school matching, resource allocation. But nowadays, um, for many reasons, people have uh, many uh, the needs for making collective decisions, uh, satisfying fairness, efficiency, and other things like when you rank an item, rank a movie, rank schools, rank a post, uh, aggregate answers on Amazon Mechanic Turk, and so on. Now, what's the challenge? Well, the challenge is uh, the application or right to the social choice, which is almost the same as the last uh, Dex tool seminar. Um, and uh, the problem is that you are given a set of axioms by people, not by you, not like you are designing these axioms and those rules, and you ask to design a mechanism to satisfy these axiomatics properties as much as possible. You may ask why this is different at all from the old social choice problems. It is, um, but it happens just more frequently, and you are just one person. You cannot solve all of these problems, um, even if you work 48 hours per day. And sometimes these actions provided by uh, the people or the users whom the decisions are made for are hard to analyze. And sometimes there are many possibility theorems. So, and maybe sometimes they don't even know what they want, but they can give you examples and ask you to design your code rules. Um, and the good news is that uh, maybe the satisfaction may not to be as strict as in political elections because um, these are just a low stakes applications. So can we sacrifice some uh, perfectness of the voting rules to gain some efficiency. So that's a question. And then naturally you would ask, can machine learning help us design the voting rules? And there's a nice approach of supervised learning uh, of a paper that I'm gonna talk about later in the related work section. Um, if you think about the supervised learning framework, I mean, typically uh, people use this empirical risk minimization. Uh, it's just one of the paradigms, but, um, but it's um, probably the most possible one. So the idea is that you are given um, some examples by the experts. So uh, the examples are tagged by uh, P and C. P means that uh, the, the expert or the people tells you, this is a profile, P1, collection of votes. This is the winner that we thought should be chosen. And then uh, the expert will tell you another instance. Oh, here is the profile, here's the winner. And then based on all of this data, you're gonna design a voting rule by minimizing the empirical risk in the sense that you're trying to minimize the total loss of here you're trying to design voting rule R that chooses the winner for each of the profiles given to you. And you see how far the winner is um, compared to the, uh, the winner given to you by the expert. And then this, there is a loss measure that could be many loss, for example, zero loss. And then you solve this optimization problem and you got your voting rule R that is gonna be used in the next presidential election, for example. Now, what are the problems? Well, first, we don't have a whole lot of data. We actually don't have a whole lot of good data because if you think about elections or other applications, 
you probably won't get people both giving you ideas of how election should be run for the same situation. Um, but anyway, we got we do not have a lot of a lot of data. Anyway, you look at preferably great or you have many, but uh, that's really 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 far away from any uh, machine learning algorithm would require. And second, actually, the, the bigger problem is that it's hard to model actual satisfaction of accidents as loss. So if you look at the traditional machine uh, uh, ERM uh, uh, paradigm, the loss function is defined as the loss of the winner classified by your voting rule and the winner uh, where it is supposed to be. But if you think about the limited neutrality, these are about the structures of the voting rule that applies to all profiles. So it's really just not as easy as to model it as a loss function. So the original paper um, just had this uh, ad hoc idea, which is using data augmentation. Um, somewhat, I mean, you probably can solve these two challenges. The idea is that you probably can get some data from an expert. For example, you can get one data point from an expert. And then you're going to add a lot of data, pretending that the voting rule you're going to learn would satisfy these desirable axiomatic properties. And many axiomatic properties can be interpreted as data generation rules in the following way. So uh, for example, conversation criteria, uh, if you remember, it really just says that whenever I see a conversation winner in the profile, it should be chosen. So automatically, this gives you a lot of training data if the voting rule must satisfy conversation criteria 100%. And if you think about anonymity, right? So uh, say, if you have already seen that your data set has this uh, uh, preference profile and winner being A, then you can exchange uh, the two votes so that the first vote becomes ACB and the winner should stay the same. You can, of course, you can add a lot of data uh, based on uh, the satisfaction of anonymity. And in neutrality, similarly, uh, if you exchange, um, you know that this, uh, this is a data set, it is a data point in your profile, uh, in your training data, you can exchange A and B, and then the winner should be exchanged in the same way. So similarly, you can do monotonicity, um, <coughs> uh, what else, um, um, consistency and other axiomatic properties. Now you have a lot of data. So how do you incorporate the, the, the consideration of all of them? Then one of the ways to do it is that you can add penalty terms to the loss function so that uh, you have the weight uh, alpha C, which C means uh, conversation criteria, uh, this ERRC means the error rate of or the, the loss of your uh, learned uh, classifier on the data that is generated according to conversation criteria. And then uh, this ERA means that you have uh, the error rate on the data generated by anonymity and so on. So you can add this uh, error terms. So in the sense that if everything is perfect, say, you have perfect generated lots of data according to satisfaction, and there exists a voting rule that can, can have zero uh, loss, then you actually can learn a voting rule uh, that hopefully would satisfy these axiomatic properties with high probability in practice. Of course, how to do it exactly is a hard problem. So we'll be working on it. Um, this is a more recent workshop paper. Um, of kind of using some of these ideas and also trying to incorporate other fairness conditions and privacy into the learning framework. And we also build an, a demo, but the demo is really just a work in progress. Uh, we're still debugging it. Um, here's what we got. Um, the highlighted part is a new voting rule learned by us satisfying these properties. I mean, all, all it matters is number of candidates for three candidates. We use this idea to learn a voting rule that satisfies Condorcet by 0.97. Uh, forget about group fairness for now. Uh, consistency by 0.96 and monotonicity by 0.97. So the nice thing about it is that uh, none of the existing rules actually beats this uh, first uh, this learned voting rule. For example, if compared to Copeland, uh, Copeland uh, the problem with Copeland's consistency, so this learned voting rule is better. If you compare to Borda. Uh, the problem with border is kind of say, and uh, this learned voting is slightly high. Of course, I mean, it's really just by a tiny bit, but uh, I mean, for three candidates, everything satisfies good properties with high uh, likelihood. So there's not a big room for improvement, but for more candidates, we are running experiments and hopefully it can be uh, done efficiently. Yeah, that was the idea. And um, quickly about uh, the related work and the future work. So uh, the supervised learning framework was proposed by Alia um, 
uh, I believe by your name, Jeff, uh, that was also a nice paper. Um, and then um, Ben and Kate recently has uh, used the neural networks to learn voting rules with good properties. And there are two um, guys from the University of Toronto who recently published a almost purely machine learning paper using uh, state-of-the-art machine learning techniques, some interest in neural networks to learn um, uh, voting rules satisfying good uh, utility uh, um, properties. And uh, Clemens and uh, co collaborators recently had a paper um, uh, using neural networks to uh, learn a bunch of, to actually fit a bunch of, of um, commonly studied voting rules. Um, and if you remember, this is actually a paper uh, that was presented at Palm Software. All right, for future work, um, maybe you would say, um, am I just proposed to use AI to kill, job, kill jobs um, by uh, researchers? Um, well, uh, yes and no. I mean, to some extent, this is hopefully uh, advancing the state of art. And unfortunately, we're not there yet. We're still far from there yet. And it's a good idea uh, for people to collaborate. There, we need expertise in machine learning. We need uh, experts in social choice to understand what might be the nice structure for the learning problems. And uh, there's big room for exploring more efficient learning method. For example, uh, we're trying reinforcement learning, active learning. None of them is extremely successful so far, by the way. <laughs> so, um, and um, we can also try to learn uh, and explainable rules in the sense that if you use a neural network, sure, you can make decisions for people, but how are you gonna explain to people that this is a good idea? So this is, um, at least on the surface, is somewhat different from what Ule has been doing because, uh, for example, we have been here trying, trying to use this explainable AI techniques, of trying to learn explainable uh, decision trees, which is successful, but only at a very small scale. Um, and how are we going to learn the axiomatic properties from people, right? So we thought they think anonymity is good, but what if they want neutrality and they cannot tell you because they have not learned this notion or their preferences uh, might be more complicated. So I think Yair has some recent work on their axiomatic properties. Um, so, um, and uh, of course we can extend it to other domains, but not, not just voting, but also um, resource allocation. Oh, and also for multi-winner rules. Uh, and um, all of these work currently are just very ad hoc and there's very little or no theoretical guarantee. Uh, the learned rule would be great or how to efficiently learn it and many other problems. So. Um, I think this is an interesting topic, and um, it's also recently old now. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm happy to accept any questions. All right, thank you, Lerong. Let's thank Lerong. Questions uh, in the chat. Yeah, there has been a bit of discussion developing, uh, starting oh. with um, Bill asking, uh, what would happen if experts respond to profile with several plausible winners? Uh, <laughs> okay. Bill, do you want to explain what kinds of things you have in mind? Oh, um, just if people were asking me for advice, I wouldn't want to impose my private theories about the best because that becomes very political. I might consider, um, you know, uh, that it's reasonable that any one of the following people uh, would be elected under those profiles and unreasonable otherwise to give a more relaxed uh, requirement in terms of fitting the data. Yeah, I think um, it's possible to incorporate these kind of labels uh, in the machine learning framework. Um, so for example, the current framework can definitely do, um, here's the profile, the winner should not be this guy. So if you say, here's the profile and the winner could be one of these, uh, I think you can still uh, just define the loss function in a way so that, um, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's forced into the current framework, uh, but how to compute the, um, the classifier or the voting rule efficiently, that's a different problem. So yeah, that, that's a good idea. And, uh, I, just to follow up quickly, I was thinking mm -hmm. that, you know, my reaction might be, uh, oh, the following three people are all reasonable winners, but he's asking me for only one, so I have to pick one, and it's almost random, but I'm going to pick one. And then that random information introduces a lot of noise into the fitting model, no? I see, I see, yes, yes. Uh, and, and I mean, a related question, um, uh, thing is that maybe you can even say um, how much certainty or uncertainty you have about this winner. So I, I, I'm pretty certain that 
this guy should be the winner versus a marginally uh, thin piece. I think this guy's marginally better than another guy. So yeah, these are interesting questions. Uh, sure. Chef, do you want to add anything? Uh, well, th there's a fairly uh, I mean, large discussion in, in mechanism, like on automated mechanism design in general, that, that seems highly related. Right? So a lot of mechanism design problem, for example, randomized mechanism, you can just write down as a well, pretty large linear program, or sometimes you know, if constraints are more complicated, then it's not linear, but still design. Uh, and, and then you have like the theoretical guarantees, maybe like assuming you can solve the, whatever program you've written down, uh, it's guaranteed uh, not just with high probability, but, but with certainty to, to hold certain properties like strategy proof test or anonymity or whatever constraints you, you encoded. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good comment. So, uh, so um, yeah, I actually didn't talk about, I, it was, you know, an open version of the slide. I didn't talk about automated mechanism design for, because uh, most of them are about uh, uh, using money to adjust incentives and technique is quite different in the sense that they model uh, these incentives as constraint and solve a constraint optimization problem. So I mean, of course- uh, well, you, you definitely don't need money. So there's a lot of AMT literature like without money, say of facility location. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Mark Wilson asked, is there a connection to distance rationalization of voting rules? Uh, distance rationalization. Uh, no, I think it can be a good one either as a constraint or, or a objective function for optimization. So yeah, that's a good point. Uh, mm -hmm. And Clemens, do you have a question? Just a very short remark, um, actually. I, I think it's important to distinguish two things. Um, the que one question is, what kind of voting rule with what properties do you want to use? That's one question. But another question is, can I justify a particular choice of candidates in some situation by using a particular voting rule? And I, I think it's important. I mean, that's all what I want to say. I mean, it's important to distinguish these two questions from each other. And it sounded a little bit when you gave your um, motivation, wrong, right? Like um, that people want to choose some candidates and then they want to, want to have the social choice theorists justify that choice, which is a little bit different than to say, oh, I want to use for my constitutional decisions in the coming 100 years, a certain voting rule with a certain property. I just, just very brief remark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, oh, yeah, as you said, so that was uh, actually the uh, goal of this work. And the other thing of uh, justifying uh, the winner I think Ule may have, or, or the justifying the voting rule, uh, Ule may have more to say. Um, and I mean, in the uh, explainable AI uh, literature, I think there's something related, like uh, how would you uh, come up with examples to justify something? So uh, I, I don't recall it for sure, but uh, there is another um, chance to do something over here. Okay, there are more questions in the chat, but we do need to move to the break now. Uh, so this will be for 10 minutes and then we'll reconvene for two more exciting talks. But during the break, you'll be put into breakout rooms where you can talk to others. And that's always a lot of fun. Uh, so see you soon. All right, welcome back. Uh, on to the third talk, which is given by Reshev uh, about a wine paper from 2012. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dominic. Let me know when to start. Now. Ah, okay. Thanks a lot for uh, inviting me. Uh, so uh, one of the reasons uh, I was uh, too excited to uh, come and talk about uh, something old is that uh, I should already have the slides, right? I mean, if it's something that we already presented, then it's presumably less work. So uh, last night I went and said, okay, though, then we need to find, uh, they, they got these slides from somewhere. Uh, they couldn't find it, couldn't find them. So uh, I was uh, 
Uh, apparently, uh, so this was at the wine uh, 2012, but uh, none of these three people on the screen attended the wine uh, 2012. Uh, so I really don't recall now uh, what happened and uh, who presented it, if, if at all. Uh, but apparently there were no slides uh, for this talk. Uh, and I discovered that last night, that the only thing I managed to recover was uh, one slide for my PhD defense, essentially just this one, uh, summing up the, the results. So this is like the, the one minute uh, version of the talk. Uh, so we start with that. And after that, you know, maybe I'll spend 10 more minutes on uh, going a little bit into the details. Okay, so uh, essentially we're talking about uh, uh, comparing equilibria. No questions? Um, comparing different equilibria in, in voting games. So this research actually started from comparing different games or different mechanisms in auctions, but the idea, the same idea, this can be applied to any game or mechanism. Um, and the particularly relevant to voting because in voting and, and even also in plurality voting, the most basic and fundamental tool of game theory with, which is Nash, Nash equilibrium is practically useless, right? So Almost any profile is a Nash equilibrium, even a pure Nash equilibrium in, in plurality. Uh, even you know, the profile where all voters vote for their least preferred candidate, you know, unless this happens to be a tie, then this is also a Nash equilibrium, uh, which is a bit disappointing for people you know, who work on game theory and um, <laughs> uh, social choice at the same time. Uh, like your largest hammer largest meanest hammer is kind of uh, uh, being taken away from you. Uh, so, but we can still ask, okay, so among these, so we still like this idea of stability in Ash is some sort of justification of stability. So suppose we had some way, uh, maybe based on, on coalitional deviations uh, to justify some equilibria better than others, then which would be the best equilibria and maybe more importantly, who would win in, in this, best equilibrium. And the short answer uh, is that uh, there, there, there's some caveats here, but the most stable winner in plurality, so, so the voting rule we use is plurality, uh, but, uh, but there are lots of equilibria and, and the most stable one essentially elects the maximum winner. Okay, so that's, that's the bottom line uh, of, of this talk. Uh, uh, there are some caveats and, and it's not always the case, but it's, under some assumptions, some weak assumptions on the board. Uh, I, I don't know if it sounds surprising or not. Uh, maybe we can go a little bit. I think the intuition is pretty simple. Um, even if the, the details are, are not as nice. Uh, okay, so uh, this slide does nothing to do with voting in particular. Uh, I noticed that uh, Nick also used the same picture of, uh, of uh, Alma. Uh, very, very good picture of him. Uh, so essentially we have this range, like on one end we have Nash equilibrium, uh, which is a, not a very strong requirement, just, just requiring that no individual can gain by, by deviation. Uh, and we know that it always exists uh, under some uh, weak assumptions, uh, especially, um, in, if, if, especially if we allow uh, randomized strategies. Um, but like we saw in, in voting, it's generally too weak. So if everything is a Nash equilibrium, or almost everything is a Nash equilibrium, then it doesn't have much predictive power. And on the other hand, Alman suggested to look at strong equilibrium, uh, essentially where no coalition can deviate or you know, uh, a coalition of deviation is, is one, like well, a bunch of voters coordinate the vote or something else such that all of them gain. Um, and the problem is, so it's a very nice solution concept. The problem is that it's re it rarely exists. Like, so there are not many games where we can find this. Uh, so the main question is, okay, what is there in between? Uh, and you know, if, if we would like to have no coalitional deviation, then maybe something in between is to have few coalitional deviation. Uh, now a short reader that I might get to the answer by the end of the talk, is um, now if you go back to plurality voting, when does a strong equilibrium exist? Okay, so this is this is actually not a difficult exercise. Uh, I'll get there. It's, it, the answer is known for, for a long time. 
Um, but I'll, I'll get back to this at the end, and if not, then remind me. Meanwhile, you can think about it. If you find the, the top too boring, then you can work, work on this question instead. Okay, so what are the strong equilibria, or when is there a strong equilibrium in plurality voting? Um, okay, so uh, slightly more formally, uh, so suppose we have two Nash equilibrium in some game. You know, in this case, it's a, it's a plurality voting game, but it can be any game. Uh, and if in A, let's say we have only a few pairs, or more generally, a few coalitions that, that can deviate, and in B, we have almost every pair that can deviate, then you know, intuitively, we would say that A is more stable than B. Uh, and I mean, this is another projection, but maybe A is more likely to actually occur in practice, you know, if, if stability concerns are, are any, anywhere relevant. Okay. Uh, pair, it's, it's a pair of uh, voters or, or uh, players or uh, agents okay? that they can collude and together do something else such that the, the, the outcome will change. So a pair of voters is still not very effective in voting with lots of pairs, but you know, we can think of larger coalitions. And then you can ask, well, okay, so but how do you compare? You know, suppose that we have you know, a lot of pairs, but fewer triplets and so on. And I argue that it doesn't really matter. So it wouldn't really matter for accepting you know, handcrafted cases. Uh, usually the, the answer would be rather consistent. Uh, but for this talk, just assume that uh, you know, we, all sizes are, are the same, okay? So we just count coalitions, we don't care about the size. Um, okay, so suppose there's a, some profile A that elects, uh, under plurality, okay, that elects some uh, candidate A, small A, okay? So first I say that uh, without loss of generality, it's enough to look at the profile where everyone votes for A, uh, now, this, of course, requires a proof. I'm not going to prove that, but it's enough to focus on profiles of this form, which are very simple. Uh, and now we want to know, like, how stable is this profile? Uh, so what we could, we could do is consider another candidate and look at this, uh, this pairwise preference just between those two candidates. Okay, and suppose that, uh, that more people prefer, more voters prefer B to A. Okay, so let's say not just more, uh, half, half the voters plus K. Okay, they actually prefer B. Then now I can start counting like how many coalitions, so we think about this profile where everyone votes for A, but if everyone votes for A, all these voters, these are the, the entire set of N voters, we can uh, partition them into two types, those that prefer A and those that prefer B, and there are actually more of them who prefer B, but they're currently voting for A. Now, what are the coalitions that can deviate? So you can think about any coalition of green players that is larger than larger than, than n over two, right? Because they could swap, just switch to B and make B win. Okay, so any subset of, of the green candidates, okay, of size uh, between n plus two and n uh, sorry n over two and n over two plus k can deviate. The, the, the coalition there are a lot of those, okay? It's exponential, it's exponential. Uh, uh, in number of voters and, and in K, okay? Um, so this is essentially the reason because this gap here, it's highly related to the maximum score of, of A, right? So essentially the maximum score of A is just the, the minimum, depends we look, from which way you're looking at it, but uh, uh, just the, the maximal K uh, when we compare to any other, uh, to any other K, okay? Uh, but there are more candidates than just A and B in this election, right? So if A is also losing to some other candidates, they also contribute uh, this sort of coalition. So this may seem like it's also related to the Copeland score of A, right? Because the Copeland score is essentially to how many candidates are you losing or how many candidates are you beating, okay? Uh, so why do I started with uh, emphasizing Max Min rather than, uh, than Copeland? because the effect of losing to another candidate is additive, right? So these coali the coalitions that uh, go to C or D or E, they just add up. On the other hand, if this margin here against B increases by just a little bit, it adds like loads of new coalitions. Okay, so this K here is much more important than uh, the rank of it. Uh, so the, the, the bottom line is that if A is more stable than B, 
we can derive uh, this inequality. It means that, uh, so uh, we would like maybe to have just the inequality on the Baxley scores, but actually Copeland also creeps in a little bit, but its effect is almost negligible. You see the, the log here. So it's mainly the maximum score uh, that determines the stability. Uh, now, because I didn't have the slide, how much time do I have left, if at all? Uh, none. No. Okay. Uh, so uh, maybe you just uh, go back to the, to the riddle. Okay. So what would happen uh, if a, a, a is a Condorcet winner? Okay. So if A is a Condorcet winner, then it's essentially it's both a, the Copeland winner and the Maximin winner. Okay. And then we will always have this, this inequality, which means that the Condorcet winner or the, the, the profile where everyone votes for the Condorcet winner is always a strong equilibrium. And you can also check that the, the converse also holds. Okay, so this is not new. This is a, this it was in a paper by Sartell and Sanver, and it was probably even all before that. Um, and it's a nice exercise for for undergrads. Uh, that's it. All right. Thank you very much. Let's unmute. Hey, Bill has a question. Yeah, just uh, this may be way off, Rashef, but I suddenly got the impression from what you were saying that if we think about a Markov process in which uh, coalitions in some random way actually do defect, perhaps changing the winner, and this happens over and over again, of course, the actual preferences don't change. Um, uh, and we look at the, the limiting proportion of uh, profiles at which a given uh, candidate wins. Is that in any way similar, going to produce the same results as what you are getting? So that's a great question. Uh, if I remember correctly, we had some sort of conjecture like that at the discussion of the paper, but we did it. So it's not obvious, right? Because th this analysis is sort of a you know, worst case. So it focuses on particular profiles. Uh, so it may sound plausible that the dynamics you describe also has same, similar properties, but um, but I'm not sure. Okay, so so we, we would like to have uh, the stronger justification uh, in the spirit of what you suggest uh, to say that you know A is more stable, not just because there is some profile that is stable, but some natural dynamics like the one that you suppose actually reaches or, or, or travels through many such profiles. Uh, we don't have such a result. Uh, if you know, if you want to take up this uh, <laughs> or assign it to students, uh, then that would be great. Yeah, I think it would make the results more compelling when you have. No, I agree. I definitely agree. Uh, Rita asked whether this is the Simpson rule. Well, the, the rule here is is just the the plurality rule. So the rule in the talk that the only rule that is actually being used is the plurality. Right. Yeah, do you want to add anything? Probably not. Simpson's just another name for Maximin. Yeah, yes, 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 that's that's right. Um, Peter, do you have a check? Peter, do you have a question? I should check. Yeah. That's, uh, that's uh, I think, uh, Edith's answer. Yeah, very good. Any other questions? Oh. No. Okay, great. Thank you, Rashev. Moving on to our fourth talk. By Klaus Nehring, do you want to share slides? Now that works, full screen. Yep. Perfect. Uh, so our fourth talk is Klaus Nehring uh, of, of a JET paper from 2007. Um, so the length of the title, you can see the title is in, inverse proportion to the length of the talk. So the <laughs> ratio is speed. Uh, hopefully I will not lose you completely. Um, it will also be abstract. 
no pictures, no humor, sorry. Uh, the paper is actually a 2010 paper, mainly abstract Aroian aggregation. It's not a paper which, which hasn't received some attention, uh, far from it. At the same time, we feel there are certain aspects which um, are, which uh, have not received quite the attention they um, deserve. Um, okay, I will start with a, an abstract aggregator. It's just a mapping from input profiles to some outputs. The elements are we call views. Um, Arroyan aggregators, which, which we, uh, I will discuss here, are based on property spaces defined in the next slide. Um, normally, the input space is equal to the output space. That's also the maintained assumption in the AAA paper. In the bulk of it, at the end, we uh, have an extension to um, restricted domains. And that's one of the, I think we have a very nice result on that, but uh, it doesn't seem to have received almost any attention. I hope I will get to that result. Um, just sketchily, okay, we, the uh, property space, basically the defining thing for a property space are properties, which are just subsets of uh, um, views. Uh, you can think of it as, uh, okay. Uh, and uh, properties, if, if, if uh, half an element, a set is a property, then its complement is always a property too. So you can think of it analogous in judgment irrigation, analogous to a proposition and its negation. And basically properties uh, allow to identify particular views. Many examples, preferences, aggregation, logically interconnected propositions, committees, resource allocation, and so on. Uh, a lead example here, just to uh, pin it down a bit, is uh, our relational property spaces, um, where a relation uh, is, a, you can think of it as a weak preference. And in that case, the uh, properties are simply the comparisons of ordered pairs. So uh, then the issue is basically whether or not for each uh, pair A, B, whether or not A is weakly preferred to B. This is issue is elicited implicitly in, uh, by stating the relation. This is uh, um, stated by every voter and the group choice uh, provides an answer on each issue um, and thereby uh, defines uh, an, the aggregate. Um, we, the key step to a row in aggregation is the use of these uh, property space structure uh, in terms of an independence axiom. So the aggregator satisfies independence if for any property, if the input two input profiles, X and Y, agree on that property, then the output profiles agree on that property as well. And we actually use a mono, natural monotone strengthening of it to get a nice characterization and derive many implications. So these are defined row and aggregators. So the characterization is in terms of structures of winning coalitions, which are familiar broadly from the uh, Arroyan type literature. And in, in this uh, setting, essentially for each uh, property, the, uh, this uh, script W defines uh, which uh, set of voters supporting that uh, property entail a group choice of that property. Um, now the problem in general, if we, if we write down some structure of winning uh, coalitions that may lead to inconsistent choices so it doesn't define a proper aggregate. Um, and the fundamental uh, characterization result uh, of the paper is to basically address this problem. When is when are these? When do these uh, voting by issue does? Uh, when does it define a consistent um, outcome? So, a key ingredient here is the notion of a critical family, which is based. So, it, a critical family is a family of propositions or a family of set which is has is inconsistent, i.e., it has empty intersection, but any subset of the family has non-empty intersection. 
So it corresponds to a minimally inconsistent subset of properties. And um, the intersection property says that if we look at any of these minimally inconsistent subsets, any critical family, then actually any selection of winning coalitions must be consistent, must have non-empty intersection. Um, and the main fundamental result of the paper is that uh, a mapping um, uh, F is a, a monotone arrow in aggregator on the property space if and only if it is voting by issues satisfying this intersection property. This is, um, this is a key result because of course we, this allows us, it's a bit like a duality theorem. It allows us to understand the structure of monotone arrow in aggregators and then as a follow-up, and that covered the bulk of the paper, is then to say, okay, which uh, property spaces allow which type of uh, monotone arrow in aggregators, like a neutral, anonymous, uh, non-dictatorial, and so on. Um, but so the, these the, the derived results, they have um, been quite widely decided, they have been has been quite a lot of follow-up work, Dietrich and List, uh, Doko Volsmann and so on, but the core result is, we feel, is underappreciated. And once you see the core result, then you see that something like a very systematic theory should be true. Um, to give you just a, a illustrate the flavor of the um, this intersection property, let's specialize it to the anonymous case. In the enormous case, the winning coalitions are just defined by quotas. What's the minimum size for a particular property to make that a coalition winning? And then the intersection property uh, boils down to a simple uh, one equality, I mean, set of equalities and a set of linear inequalities. We have an integer programming problem, basically. And um, to we can illustrate, for instance, the how uh, we obtain from the general um, uh, intersection property characterization, uh, characterization of the Pareto preordering uh, in an Arroyan, uh, in the Arroyan framework. So here we look at the um, aggregate uh, transitive uh, relations. We can think of it as preorders, reflexivity doesn't really matter. So um, an aggregator on the space of transitive uh, relations is anonymous and monotone Arroyan if and only if it is unanimity, unanimity rule, i.e. the Pareto preorder. Let me um, just uh, give a brief proof here. Um, so take any triple and any critical family. I'm giving that any critical family, that means basically a contradiction to the uh, transitivity assumption so it consists of the property that A is weakly preferred to B, B is weakly preferred to C, but A is not weakly preferred to C. Uh, that by the anonymous intersection uh, version of the intersection property we get, uh, for this triple we get um, a linear inequality, which simplifies by the second line. There are three, um, six pairs. Um, so there are six such inequalities. If we add them up, we get um, the last uh, displayed uh, inequality. And since there are six uh, terms, a uh, winning coalition can have most, have as most N members, um, all of the quotas must be equal to N. So I hope you see here the, the role of the, the critical family and the simplicity with which one can derive certain results. Now you could, as a view, that is kind of concrete, that's preference aggregation. You could say that's a relatively weak result in the sense that this input space is very large. And you could say, well, individuals, while um, transitivity may be the only requirement as a rationality requirement on the output space, um, in the input you may, for instance, have, uh, it may be given that individuals' preferences are complete. So, um, in this case, so the challenge is to um, go now to restricted domains where the input space is smaller than the output space. So um, that's Two minutes the now. last part of the paper, and that's the most 
um, kind of the okay, which uh, is prob least probably least recognized. So here we have um, uh, we, we consider basically uh, cases where the input space is contained in the output space. There is an analogous where we have to refine the definition of a critical family to effectively critical that associates uh, a definition of a, a restriction of the intersection property. We don't get a full characterization now, but we get a one-way implication, namely that a monotone Aronian aggregator um, must be voting by issues where the winning coalition satisfies this restricted intersection property. Okay, as an, as an illustration here, the, the previous result we can obtain a kind of as a corollary, um, the following theorem more general result, um, which now uh, is rely relies on a certain richness assumption on the input space. I'm not going into details that corresponds to the effectivity constraint on the critical families. And uh, the generalization is if we have the, um, uh, the uh, if we aggregate so X is a space of transitive relations and Y a rich subset of it. Then the mapping uh, an aggregator is uh, anonymous and monotone Arrowian, if and only if it is again the Pareto preorder. And the step from the uh, previous result is basically to, to basically observe or check that the richness assumption implies that all critical families which were used in the previous result, all critical families from transitivity are effective. So using the previous proposition, we get this uh, generalization. And now from, uh, for, uh, you can say, well, that's a kind of a nice impossibility result because it says if you have these un, kind of unstructured preference spaces, you, all you can get, do ordinarily is uh, Pareto. Of course, the traditional question is, can you do more? We know in some cases you can do more and that's the last, um, result I want to present. Um, and we know, for instance, an example where you can do more is single peak preference on a line. So we, we, we generalize this question and ask now if we have single peak preferences on graphs, where graph can be any connected graph, when do you get which kind of possibility or impossibility? So single peakness on a graph is very naturally defined. Okay, if you have an alternative, Z, um, and uh, compared to another alternative Y, which is closer to the preference peak, then Y must be preferred to Z. Um, that's well defined for any graph. And um, so we can ask this uh, question, what aggregate, aggregators uh, are possible? Um, particular role is played by biconnected graphs, which are not just connected, but they're also connected if you remove any one vertex. So you see here in this picture, the, the, um, the line and the tree are not biconnected, but all the other graphs are biconnected. And if you take a, so uh, we get then the following result that uh, if, uh, so we aggregate into linear orders in this case, if we have, um, if the graph is biconnected as just explained, then every, monotone everyone aggregator is dictatorial. On the other hand, if you want that the, the, the B talks about some intermediate cases where you get non-dictatorial aggregators, but they can be quite degenerate. If you ask the aggregator to be either locally non-dictatorial, which means not dictatorial on any particular property or anonymous, which is somewhat stronger then the only uh, a graph which um, um, allows you to get those aggregators is the line. Then, of course, we now have the classical median, um, median voter aggregation. Now, it's interesting kind of to finalize as a, um, to compare these, um, the Arroyan possibility results on Arroyan aggregation to possibility results on strategy proof social choice. So, strategy proof social choice that was in, in an earlier paper one based on a um, on paper by Barbara Masso and Neme, we, um, uh, we, we used um, 
that characterization to, uh, to basically show that for generalized single peak preferences, monotone um, so strategy, proof, strategy proof social choice <laughs> functions are um, monotone erroian aggregators. The monotone erroian aggregators on the under on the underlying um, alternative space. In contrast, so uh, as a corollary, one can get all the possibility uh, possibility results on uh, erroian aggregators uh, extend. So if we go um, back here to the to these um, to these graphs, for example, we can. Um, the, uh, there's a full answer to into each graph. What is, is what kind of strategy proof social choice functions are possible? Well, in li lines, uh, as usual, trees famously admit also just uh, majoritarian uh, um, strategy proof social choice function. The same for hypercubes. These are median spaces. The uh, top, uh, the bottom left uh, admits anonymous strategy proof social choice functions. And the two on the right admit only dictatorial strategy proofs on choice functions. So you have. Right, I think we have to wrap up now. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, this is a perfect point, uh, uh, perfect point to end. So, there's an interesting contrast between the strategy proof uh, aggregation and the erosion aggregation. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, very ambitious talk. We have just a very few minutes left for any questions. Reshef notes that Schoma and Fora showed that facility location for single peakness must be dictatorial if there are cycles. I suppose that's related to that theorems would, you mentioned. That's why it's something like cycle by connectedness implies a certain cyclicity. That that would be yeah that would be in the in the realm B per se. Yeah, and then Note the that four goes. cycles, four cycles are allowed. I mean, it's it's only so certain cycles are allowed. Four cycles because they they can occur in median graphs. No, no, but for okay, are you talking about strategy, uh, Dominic? You are talking about yes. strategy proofness or erroneous aggregation? Strategy proofness. Okay, yeah. Then four cycles. That's right. Four cycles are allowed. That, so strategy proofness. The picture is much much different for erosion then basically the existence of, of cycles implies local dictatorship already existence of some cycles in the graph that's that's an aspect of this uh, biconnectedness mm -hmm. yeah. so is is is, it, is there more is there something monotonic is dicta dictatorship non dictatorship uh, sorry strategy proofness worse than arrow or is arrow worse than strategy proofness Error is, worse than, error is worse than strategy proofness because essentially in, in the strategy proofness, you only aggregate the tops. In the other one, you aggregate uh, orderings. So you have the, the independence become stronger in a way. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, then thanks again. Uh, and let's end with a few announcements. Uh, we are going to have one more um, episode of the seminar this academic year and we'll then go into a summer break. Uh, so as before, we won't have seminars in July uh, and August, and then we'll reconvene in September. And for June's session, I'll give hand over to Edith. So, so June session is going to be somewhat non-traditional again. So in the last months, so we lost two members of the combinatorial optimization fixed parameter tractability community had close links with the Comsoc community. That's Rolf Niedermeyer and Gerhard Wöginger. So what we thought we'd do next time in June is to run a memorial session, uh, kind of talking about kind of the contribution of these two scientists and how it influenced our field. So Piotr Felishevsky agreed to chair it. So we don't have an exact pro program list of talks up, but it will be announced soon on the website. And that will be on June 9th. Okay, I hope to see many of you there. And thanks for coming. I think that was great fun. All right, see you again. Bye. <laughs>